So we are talking here with Zachary Lockman, who is the author of, of this book. And um, that's a kind of an interesting title. Uh, comrades and enemies seem to be contradictory. Maybe you could explain what you mean by that title and the basic theme of the book. Sure. Well, I, I chose the title because it, it was, in fact, uh, at least at first look, contradictory. Um, it's hard to be both a comrade and uh, and an enemy at the at the same moment. Uh, so the, the title is, in fact, contradictory, and I chose it because um, comrade and enemy are not terms you usually see together. Um, the book explores the relationship um, over a, an extended period of roughly, you know, 40 years from from the period before the First World War down to 1948, when Palestine was was partitioned uh, between uh, Jewish and Arab labor movements and and workers, uh, especially workers who interacted with one another in, in various mixed workplaces. Um, and it's a complicated relationship, which went through a variety of different phases. Um, uh, I, we can explore some of these questions in more detail, but basically it, it explored a certain contradiction in that the, the Jewish labor movement in Palestine, the Zionist labor movement, or labor Zionism as it's often referred to, which combined uh, a, a faith, a commitment to Zionism with a belief in socialism, had uh, a very um, ambivalent relationship towards uh, the developing Arab working class in Palestine. Um, there were those who wanted to organize Arab workers. There were those who wanted to exclude them from employment in, in the Jewish sector of Palestine's economy in order to create or preserve more jobs for Jews. Um, there were big debates about this within the labor Zionist movement. Uh, on the other side, um, the, the, the nascent Arab working class, especially from the 1920s onward, which began to develop trade unions, which began to try to improve conditions for Arab workers, um, by and large, uh, shared um, the, the opposition of Palestine's Arab majority to Zionism because they saw it as a movement of foreigners which was seeking to displace them or dispossess them in their own homeland and create a Jewish majority in a Jewish state. Um, on the other hand, there were circumstances in which um, there was an opportunity for even a, a need for some degree of cooperation in places where both Arabs and Jews work together. And this created a complicated set of stories and relationships that stretched on until 1948, when the vast when when half the Arab population of Palestine was was displaced, was driven out, or or fled from their homes amidst the warfare, and then found themselves refugees, unable to return home. You know, you referred to um, socialist Zionism or Zionist socialism, and it seems to me. You know, socialism poses that all workers have to combine, regardless of background, against all capitalists. And Zionism poses that all Jews, workers, and capitalists have to combine. So it seems to me to be a complete contradictory uh, contradiction in terms. What are your thoughts on that? So we can certainly see it that way, but, but uh, there were lots of people who did not see it that way, right? Who did not see it as a contradiction. Um, and, and there are many cases, in fact, where socialist movements adopted a nationalist coloration, right, or, or uh, organized a specific groups of worker based on ethnicity or other factors. Uh, for example, one of, one of the most important uh, Jewish social movements in Eastern Europe uh, until the Second World War, when the masses of European Jews were murdered, was the organization known as the Bund. It was a Jewish socialist movement with very widespread support. And it organized Jewish workers specifically. Now it always said we are co collaborating, we we're going to cooperate with Russian workers before the Russian revolution, with Polish workers and so on to create a democratic and socialist Russia, Poland, et cetera, in which Jews will be a, an equal minority. But they were organizing first and foremost as, as Jews and, and in the language of the Jewish masses in Yiddish, right, rather than other languages. So it's not unheard of. In the case of Zionism, right, this was a um, a diverse movement from the very beginning, alongside what we might call bourgeois Zionists like Theodor Herzl and 
and uh, the preeminent leader of the Zionist movement on the international arena, Chaim Weizmann, who became, becomes Israel's first president in 1948. Um, you have religious Zionists who combine a, 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 the, the faith of, of, of Judaism in its orthodox form with Zionism, even as the vast majority of orthodox rabbis denounce Zionism as, as false messianism. Um, and you also have people who are influenced by the socialist currents that were so powerful among the Jewish masses in Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century. They combine this with their Zionism. And so they argue that the, the future Jewish society, the future Jewish state in Palestine should not be just another capitalist society, another capitalist state where the rich oppress and exploit the poor. It should be socialist um, and Jewish workers will be the vanguard of this project of immigration and settlement and, and create a new kind of society. So looking back, of course, we can say that this was um, rather uh, an illusion. Um, and when it came down to it in the institutions that, that the labor Zionist movement created in Palestine, in the Jewish community in Palestine, which were very influential in the state of Israel, which this movement dominated into the 1970s, um, the Zionism was a lot more important than the socialism. And uh, it was these people, right? People like David Ben-Gurion and, and his allies and various other groups, parties, factions on the, in, within the labor Zionist camp who created the state of Israel, basically, and who oversaw the dispossession of the Palestinians and the destruction of Palestinian Arab society in 1948. Um, and they were always ready to give priority to Jewish immigration and Jewish settlement even as they created certain institutions, which some of which remain today, the kibbutz in a somewhat modified form, the labor federation, the histadrut, and so on, you know, which are which are much weaker than they once were, and um, and Israel, of course, is a very different place than it was 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, they left an imprint, nonetheless, and in their time, they convinced themselves certainly that they could be good socialists in a certain kind of way, um, as well as as well as committed Zionists, um, even though they pursued policies which um, were often quite hostile to Arab workers and, and the emerging Arab trade union movement. You know, you referred to, you mentioned the Bund, and um, it, it seems to me that one issue is... Well, let me put it this way. When you look at social democracy and the social democratic parties, all of them, in some ways, it seems to me, tried to square the circle and see some sort of uh, um, common interest with their own capitalist class. And so most of them ended up supporting their own capitalist class in World War II. I mean, excuse me, World War I. So in some... Would you agree that labor Zionism was in its own way, in part, an expression of that contradiction? Yes, but they were in very different circumstances, right? This this labor Zionist movement, when it's got its start in the first years of, of the 20th century, and, and when the first uh, members of this movement arrived in Palestine, right, there was very little of a Jewish capitalist class, and there was very little of a Jewish working class. So they came with the vision of creating a Jewish working class in Palestine. Um, now they were gonna do this, they hope with capital from the Zionist movement, right? Donations collected abroad, um, which would be channeled, they hoped, into institutions they controlled into creating the kinds of forms of settlement, collective settlements like the kibbutz, cooperative settlement, settlements like the Moshav and other things, um, and, and into, industrial development eventually, which would be controlled by the Histadrut, the, the, the Labor Zionist Federation of Labor, um, and, and serve the interests of, of, of that movement and not purely that of capitalist investors, right? I mean, Zionism was not a um, high profit kind of enterprise for Jewish investors or for any kind of investors, right? It was a nationalist enterprise. And, and of course, the Zionist movement collected donations from people, from Jews in many parts of the world, including richer Jews. Um, but people weren't doing this because they expected to make big money from this. They did this because they were imbued with a, a certain nationalist vision 
So um, you're right, of course, the, for the outbreak of the First World War and the fact that uh, the leaders of, of most of the socialist or social democratic parties in, in Europe uh, voted for the war, supported their war efforts in Germany and France and Britain and elsewhere, um, was, a, was a huge disaster for the international socialist movement, which for years had said workers will not kill other workers on behalf of, of their capitalists. And in fact, that's what most of them ended up doing. And, and the few parties which refused to do this, like the Bolshevik party and others, um, end up being the, the nucleus of the new international communist movement. So this doesn't bear very directly on, on Palestine, although the Zionist movement in the First World War receives the endorsement of Great Britain, whose military forces are at that moment in 1917 when the Balfour Declaration is issued, so declaring Britain's support for the creation of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. At that very moment, British and allied military forces are conquering Palestine from the Ottomans, which makes it then possible for the, the Zionist enterprise to get off the ground in which, in, in a way, it would never have without that British support, the support of the biggest imperialist power on earth, and, and without the fact that Palestine was now, in effect, part of the British Empire. So could it be, couldn't it be argued then that until a significant Jewish capitalist class developed in Palestine, that Zionism really worked under the protective wing of the British capitalists or British colonialism. Absolutely. They were linked to. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So from the beginning, and this is true of Theodore Herzl, who, who founds uh, Zionism as a modern political movement, right, from 1897 onwards, uh, and his successors after he dies, uh, their top priority, um, of course, they're supporting settlement in Palestine. It's on a small scale. But their, the top priority of the leadership was to find a patron, to find one of the major European powers as a patron. They talked to the German government. Uh, Herzl went to visit the government of the Tsar in, in Russia. Um, they lobbied the British government on and on. They were not successful until the circumstances of the First World War when um, Britain's government felt it useful for the war effort for a variety of reasons we can discuss if it's, if it's worth doing, to embrace Zionism. And um, and again, to, to endorse publicly the establishment in Palestine of, of what the British termed a national home for the, for the Jewish people, whatever that meant exactly. So Zionism in 1917 fi finally found the great power patron, the imperialist power patron that it had been looking for for a long time. And it was the fact that the British ruled Palestine, established a colonial regime in Palestine at the end of the First World War and down to 1948 that made... Uh, significant Jewish immigration, land purchases, settlement, and state building possible, right? And it was British bayonets that uh, suppressed Palestinian Arab opposition to Zionism, because from the beginning, of course, Palestinian Arabs, who are the vast majority of the population in Palestine, and still two-thirds of, of the population in 1947, um, opposed Zionism, because they understood that this was a project designed to create a Jewish majority in a Jewish state in Palestine, which would mean their, their dispossession or their subordination to an, what they perceived of as an alien majority of immigrants uh, against their wishes. And so it was British guns that, that crushed Palestinian efforts to, to resist this. You know, in, in your book, jumping to another uh, question, in your book, you talk about the, the Arab workers. Nowadays, we talk about Palestinian people. So could you explain, you know, that terminology that you use in the book? Sure. So uh, after 1948, and it was a somewhat gradual process, Palestinian became the, the, the common name for the Arab people of Palestine. Before 1948, people used different things. Usually Palestinian wasn't used on its own. People usually uh, use the term Palestinian Arab. So various organizations, uh, nas the national movement, et cetera, refer to, uh, refer to themselves as Palestinian Arab, right? So, you know, this is a, a complicated thing, right? There, 
many countries uh, across North Africa and, and the Middle East in which the majority of the population speaks Arabic. And in the late 19th century, uh, a new uh, cultural Arabism emerged and a proto-nationalism and eventually a full-blown Arab nationalist movement, which said um, the Arabs are a nation and they should have independence as a nation, not be subject to the Ottoman Empire, not be subject to the various colonial powers which divided up the Middle East after the First World War and so on. So there's a common Arab nationalism, but of course, um, there also developed what we might call local nationalisms, territorial nationalisms, which are somewhat different in places like Syria from and Lebanon and Palestine and, and Jordan eventually in Iraq, right? Most of which um, were new states whose boundaries were drawn by the British and French in keeping with their own imperialist interests. So even though they're, they're of course, people, they speak dialects of the same language, the the, um, the written language in the language used in higher registers is a common language called modern standard Arabic. Um, there's also local differences and efforts to unite these states politically have not succeeded. It's sort of like Latin America, where after the, 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 uh, the yoke of Spanish colonial rule was overthrown, there were all sorts of projects to create much bigger states. Um, and most of those ultimately failed. And instead you have Colombia and Venezuela and Argentina and so on as separate states um, speaking more or less a common language. This is to leave out the indigenous populations from, from the story. Um, and of course the Palestinians, the Arabs of Palestine faced a, uh, a challenge that was not uh, there for the, for the people of Lebanon or of Syria or of Transjordan or of Iraq. Right, all those places were under colonial rule, whether British or French, and there were long struggles from the end of the First World War when they demanded their independence but were refused it, until, generally, depending on on the case, you know, several decades later, in some cases until after the Second World War, that they won their independence from colonial rule. So this was an issue, of course, for the Arabs of Palestine as well. From the beginning, they demanded their independence as the majority population, their right to self determination as Woodrow Wilson had supposedly promised them, um, they were denied. But they faced not just colonial rule, they faced this under the protection of the colonial regime, an influx of, of Jews from Europe who were not there to blend in with the local population, but were there to build up a, a separate new Jewish society, which would be the basis of a future Jewish state and a future Jewish majority. Right, so this is this this settler colonial issue is something that was not faced in Iraq or Syria or or Lebanon. It was faced in Algeria, a process which had begun much earlier, uh, when the French began conquering Algeria in 1830, uh, and it was only 1962 when Algeria won its independence um, after a very long and and bloody struggle. So that difference in Palestine puts the Palestinians uh, in on a very different trajectory. Um, and of course, it was a trajectory that in 1948 led to the partition of Palestine, the establishment of Israel in three quarters of what had been British ruled Palestine. And again, the displacement of half of Palestine's Arab population who lose their land, lose their homes, um, and end up as refugees either in, in Gaza or in the West Bank or beyond the borders of historic Palestine, a, a, a massive well, the Palestinians call it the catastrophe, right? The Nekba. Um, and Israel remains, uh, gains control of three quarters of what had been Palestine amidst the fighting of that period. You know, up until the rise of Hitler, the, the immigration of Jews, of European Jews into Palestine was really just a trickle. Um, and would you agree that Many of the Jews that came there came there as much for economic reasons as for any ideological reasons of building a Jewish homeland and that sort of thing. Well, I'm not sure I'd put it quite that way because, um, you know, if, if you look at the numbers from before the First World War and, and the very early waves of, of Jewish immigration, of Zionist immigration, um, something like half of those who came left. And, and either went back to Europe or they went on to Western Europe or they went to the Americas, to the United States and elsewhere, because economic conditions were difficult, right? This is one of the challenges that the labor Zionist movement had to create enough jobs, enough employment, 
so that people would would actually stay because they understood if people couldn't if it wasn't economically viable for people to stay they would they would move on um, i would put it a little bit differently which is you know the, the numbers of uh, if if you look at the mass out migration of jews from eastern europe from about 1880 until you know the united states and various european countries shut immigration in the mid 1920s right in the united states it was 1924 in other countries this was about the same time millions of east european jews moved they migrated to escape oppression to escape poverty right most of them ended up in the united states that's where the american jewish community comes from by and large um if you look at the percentage who chose to go to palestine it's something like two percent of that vast wave of out migration so i don't think most of those people went in search of economic opportunity, the economic opportunities were much better in France or Britain or the United States or Latin America or South Africa. Some of them went to. Um, they went because they were imbued um, by a vision of participating in uh, a movement of Jewish national revival and Zionism in one form or another, whatever they understood by this. But their numbers were small. So the, the, the large uh, influx of Jews into Palestine comes when people have no other choice and nowhere else to go. So the, the size of the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yeshuv, uh, expanded dramatically in the early 1930s because um, there were few other places to go to escape the depression because the Nazi party came to power in Germany in 1933. And because Poland, where uh, a, a large percentage of the Jews of, of Europe lived at the time, had an increasingly nationalist and anti-semitic government which was trying to push jews out and at that point there was no more, there were a few other places to go that were willing to admit poor poor jewish refugees in palestine the, there were limits imposed by the british on jewish immigration but there was still a possibility of of getting there right and uh similarly in 19 after 1948 um, there was, well, there was an influx, of course, of Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, a significant number, but there was an even larger wave or several waves of Jewish immigration from predominantly Muslim countries, predominantly Arab countries, because these very ancient communities, which had been very uh, integrated into their societies for a very long time, found their position no longer viable. They were squeezed between Zionism on the one hand and um, an Arab nationalism, which tended to see them as, as collaborators or as Zionists or as responsible in some sense for what happened to the Palestinians. Um, and so they were they, in their vast majority, picked up and, and left, right, from Egypt, from Iraq, from North Africa a little bit later on, and so on. And many of them, most of them went to Israel. Um, some went to France, but others from, from North Africa, but many of them went to Israel, such that um, within a few decades, and that is the case today, half of Israel's Jewish population, more than half of Israel's Jewish population, is of Middle Eastern origin rather than European origin, even though they remain um, uh, somewhat uh, uh, subordinate in terms of education levels, in terms of class location, and various other things compared to the uh, the East the European Jewish establishment in Israel. From my understanding, just historically, there was very little conflict between the Jewish and the Arab population in historic Palestine until the advent of Zionism. And so it seems to me then that what you're saying is that the the rise of Zionism in Palestine created a conflict not only in Palestine between Jews and Arabs, but in the entire Arab world. I think that's by and large true. Um, Zionism had very little interest in the Jewish communities of, of the Middle East and North Africa, right? It's, it was a European movement. It's, it was focused on the, the plight of Jews in Eastern Europe, and, it, and, and Zionism emerged as one of multiple responses to the uh, deteriorating situation of Jews in Eastern Europe, where the, where the majority of the world's Jews lived in the later 19th century. Again, persecution, oppression, pogroms in Tsarist Russia, uh, and on and on. And again, most many people voted with their feet and left. Others clung to traditional ways. Others uh, embraced socialism, 
and the vision of creating a uh, of getting rid of the Tsarist regime and creating a democratic Russia in which all the oppressed peoples uh, and oppressed classes of the Tsarist empire would would achieve equality and freedom. So people had many responses. Zionism was was um, was one of them. In Palestine itself, before the advent of Zionism, Jews were a very small minority, maybe 5% of the population. Um, many of them were Arabic speaking. Some of them had been in the country for a very long time. Um, there, there was a strong uh, religious Jewish community, people who came to study and be buried in the land of the, in the Holy Land um, and so on. But, you know, no, no political ambitions, no vision of, of national revival or, or, or creating a Jewish state. Um, so, we don't want to paint too rosy a picture that everything was always wonderful, right? There were instances in in for Jewish communities in predominantly Muslim societies of harassment and persecution and discrimination. There were such. Um, if we had to generalize, I think it's safe to say that the situation of the Jewish minority in predominantly Muslim countries was a lot better overall than the situation of the Jewish majorities uh, minority, excuse me, in predominantly Christian countries in Europe. Right where there were expulsions, harassment, pogroms, on and on. Right, which was not typically the case. Segregation, all sorts of things. But uh, for Palestine itself, right, once um, you begin to get significant numbers of Jewish immigrants coming, not to integrate into local society, but to build a separate, self-contained Jewish society uh, as a stage in the development of a Jewish majority and eventually a Jewish state in Palestine. There is, of course, going to be tensions and hostilities uh, at the political level, but sometimes between new Jewish settlers and the Arab villagers who live next door, who have very different ways of dealing with the land and, and ideas about land ownership and so on, local tensions. Um, but they get subsumed, certainly, um, eventually by, by political tensions, right? By the end of the First World War, the British, from the Arab point of view, have promised Palestine to the Jews even though Jews are maybe 10% of the population. And there is a Palestinian Arab national movement which says we have the right to self-determination in our own homeland, just like any other people, just like the Czechs and the Poles and the Hungarians whom Woodrow Wilson allowed to have states. Why can't the Arabs have states of their own that are independent? We can rule ourselves. Um, and these these demands, these uh, this, this movement ultimately from 1936, an armed revolt, by Palestinian Arabs against British colonial rule and against the Zionist enterprise it protected and fostered breaks out. The British eventually crush it. Um, but it's it's clear that it tensions, any possibility of, of coexistence between Arabs and Jews is going to uh, not be viable given the larger political struggle over control of this land, which of course culminates in the events of 1948. You know, you wrote a book that's nearly 400 pages long that focuses almost entirely on the working class. But yet in Palestine, amongst the Arabs, it was the the small farmers, the, the Lahin or wh whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. that was the great majority. So why did you focus on the working class in this book? Well, you're certainly right that that workers in, you know, modern industrial enterprises and urban construction, um, but wage workers in agriculture, right? Palestine was famous for its Jaffa oranges, right? Somebody picked those oranges uh, and various other kinds of enterprises. Um, you know, we're a minority of the population. The great majority of the population, as you say, were, were peasants, were small farmers either on their own small plots or, or working for larger landlords. Arab landlords. So um, it was a largely agrarian society, although in the course of the late 19th and, early, and 20th centuries, right, the cities developed uh, a great deal, became significant urban centers, Jaffa, Haifa, Jerusalem, a number of others at a smaller scale. So there was a large thriving Arab uh, middle class, um, intellectuals, journalists, lawyers, and so on, um, business people and so on. So this, you know, was a society which was changing and would have changed, you know, even without the the impact of of Zionism and the capital it brought to Palestine. So I, um, 
I chose to focus on this group uh, in large part because from the 1930s into the 1970s, the dominant uh, political, social, cultural, economic camp within the Jewish community in Palestine and the state of Israel after 1948 um, was the labor Zionist camp. All right, from the mid 1930s, when Ben Gurion, who's head of the Histadrut, uh, becomes the chair of the executive of the Jewish agency in Palestine, the sort of central institution of the of the Jewish community in Palestine, and, and a and a leader in the world Zionist movement, and his allies control key institutions, um, economic institutions, companies, uh, insurance companies, banks. Um, industrial enterprises, you know, on and on. And of course, uh, many of the forms of Jewish agricultural settlement, the kibbutz movement, the Moshavim, the cooperative settlements, on and on, they they constitute a power. So it's no coincidence that in 1948, when Israel is established, Ben-Gurion becomes its first president, excuse me, its first prime minister, um, because he's the, the preeminent leader of the most powerful uh, camp, so to speak, uh, within the, the Jewish community in Palestine. And it's the the Labor Party in its various forms. It's not called that until much later, but in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, it's the Labor Zionist movement, the Labor Party and its allies who dominated Israeli politics, who lead every single government, right? This changes in 1977, when for the first time, the Israeli right, led by Menachem Begin, uh, wins an election, for the Israel's parliament, the Knesset, and with its allies create uh, constitutes a government uh, without the labor Zionist camp. So in that whole period um, that, and even before that, um, the, the labor Zionist movement had to deal with the question of Arab workers. There are very few Jewish workers. There's a very small Jewish working class. It's, it's in a precarious position. And they're very vigorous debates, with which I try to reconstruct within the labor Zionist movement about how to relate to Arab workers. And it, it was a practical as well as a political question, right? Again, um, it was clear you're not going to get immigrants, Jewish immigrants to Palestine to stay unless they have employment, right? So then there are debates. So where, where do those jobs come from? Um, do we take them away from Arab workers? And this was a central demand of the labor Zionist movement for decades. Jewish employers should employ only Jews, even though Arab workers will work for lower wages, whether in the citrus groves, picking oranges and lemons, in construction, in, in the Palestine Railways, uh, an agency of the British mandate government and so on, um, the, the Zionist movement should push that, uh, should demand that only, uh, the Jewish employers employ only Jewish workers. Now, there were some on the Jewish Zionist left who opposed this and said, no, no, we should try to organize workers, Arab workers, increase their wages so they won't be a competition for us. If they get the same wages as us, there's no reason that employers will, will prefer Arabs to Jews, right? So there are vigorous debates about this. Ultimately, the labor Zionist movement settles on a policy of exclusion, basically. Again, that demand that Jewish employers employ only Jews and, and they tried to get the mandatory government, the government of Palestine, the British colonial regime, to employ as many Jews as possible. Of course, this created tension because it meant that there were efforts to drive Arab workers out of their jobs. And of course, they resented that and, and resisted that. So it's that tangle of, of issues. And, and it gets us back to your original question about comrades and enemies, right? Because on the one hand, the labor Zionists talked about you know, class unity across across national lines, across ethnic lines. They call themselves socialists. At the same time, they were pursuing policies which um, tried to drive Arab workers out of their jobs, and 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 gain those jobs for for Jews, right? And and they saw themselves as a central, as the central component of the Zionist enterprise against you know other political forces within the Jewish community. Who weren't interested in socialism, who had other visions of developing the Jewish community and 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 policies of the Zionist movement. Um, so there's a set of issues in there which I tried to explore. Um, finally, let me say, you know, by the 30s and 40s, there's a substantial Arab working class in Palestine, and their new political forces, especially during the war period, the period of the Second World War and afterward, right? Um, there's a growing communist presence. Right, trying to organize workers, 
with a somewhat different vision for its for the relationship with with Jews in Palestine than the than the Arab the official so to speak Arab nationalist movement has. Um, they believe they're communists, right? They believe in internationalism. They're opposed to Zionism, of course, um, but they you know they have a different line. So that too is is an interesting development. Um, it doesn't alter the outcome in 1948, which is perhaps which was perhaps inevitable um, that Zionism would, would lead to the dispossession of, of much of the Arab population of Palestine. Um, but you know, no, no historical outcome is, is uh, foreseeable or foreordained. So I, I hope to explore the, the visions that people had, even if in, in the end they, they proved dead ends. You know, I, I want to get to that question of the role of the, of the communists, but before I do, in reading your book and in listening to you describe what in some ways was a contradictory attitude on the part of labor Zionism towards the Arab workers, I couldn't help but think about my own experience. I was in the Carpenters Union for decades, and there you saw the union leadership have a very contradictory attitude towards non, non-union uh, uh, construction work, because this is true across all the building trades, where they, on the one side, sought to combine with the unionized contractors against the non-union contractors. Mm -hmm. and, but also, they sought to help to raise the wages of the non-union uh, carpenters or construction workers so that the non-union contractors um, would have, you know, could, could uh, would have increasing difficulty in competing with the union contractors. Mm -hmm. and it seems to me that what you're describing is something similar with regard to Arab workers and Jewish workers. Yeah, I, I there are definitely some similarities, right? When when there were debates about this before, but especially before the First World War, but especially in the 1920s, there were people at the sort of far left end of the Zionist spectrum who said, you know, we shouldn't try to exclude Arab workers, we should try to organize them, right? Because they're our fellow workers. And, but but of course, they also were arguing if we, organ if we help them organize and raise their wages, they won't be a competition for us. They won't be taking jobs that we could have, right? So that contradiction people live with, they lost out. And ultimately those who said, no, no, we should build an entirely separate, you know, relatively high wage Jewish economy in Palestine as disconnected in, as possible from the labor force uh, and from other factors in the in the Palestinian Arab economy and try to make sure that every job in the Jewish sector of Palestine's economy goes exclusively to Jews, which may mean protests, which may mean, you know, threatening employers, whatever. And that's the strategy that won out and, and provided the basis for developing a you know, fairly self-sufficient Jewish economy in Palestine that would withstand the Arab revolt of 1936-39 and then go on to conquer most of Palestine in 1948. So yeah, this is an issue which comes up in, in labor movements and, and class issues in many places with, of course, the specificities, the specific character characteristics of what, what was going on in Palestine uh, between Arabs and Jews in this period. Yeah, um, of course, the way my union leadership always saw it was we're going to organize them, but they are not, and as well as our own members, are not an independent, don't have real agency themselves. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that was the attitude or the way I'm reading what you what you describe in the book, that was the attitude towards the Arab workers. At the time, we're going to organize them but we must do everything we can to prevent them from actually organizing themselves. Yes, ab absolutely. There, I mean, I, I think, you know, many, maybe most of the Jews coming to Palestine from Europe, you know, shared in, in what we today call, you know, European colonial attitudes. They saw the Arabs as backward, as ignorant, as needing to be civilized. Um, many early Zionists paid no attention whatsoever to the Arabs of Palestine. Somehow they would just disappear or they'd move elsewhere. Or conversely, they would come to realize that Zionism was good for them, 
right? And this was a, a, a powerful theme in, in Zionist uh, rhetoric about the, the Arabs of Palestine. The Jews are bringing investment, they're bringing capital, they're bringing development, they're creating jobs. This is good for the Arabs. And if only they understood that, they wouldn't be opposed to Zionism. And, and if, they're not under, if they don't understand that, it's because of outside agitators, right? It's the outside agitator theory of history. It's, it's, it's people who hate Jews inciting them. Uh, against Zionism, even though Zionism is in their own interest. And so, of course, um, e even those who, who favored organizing Arab workers or supporting their organization of Arab workers um, didn't want them to be political in any sense, didn't like it when, of course, those Arab workers shared the perspective of the vast majority of the Arabs in Palestine that Zionism was a threat, right? And even if in some cases they benefited from support in very specific circumstances uh, of Jewish workers and labor organizations, um, they also understood that, you know, there were ways in which these people, you know, these the, 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 the Jews or the Zionist movement was a was a threat to their future in this country. So, you know, lots of contradictions. Um, at some point, the Zionist labor movement, you know, ran, set up and ran a sort of, what can you call it, a front organization called the Palestine Labor League in English. Um, to organize Arab workers under its auspices and used its ability to provide jobs to recruit people. But they did this very consciously to prevent Arab workers from developing ties to the Arab national movement, which is, was, of course, opposed to Zionism and, and later to the communists uh, as well. Um, and, and it was clearly a, a, a sort of subordinate organization designed to, you know, organized specific groups of Arab workers to serve the Zionist cause, basically. And of course, eventually, most Arab workers figured this out. And whatever benefits they might gain from that connection were outweighed by, by the understanding that they were being controlled, manipulated, used um, for, for a project in which, which was not in their interest. You know, you spend quite a uh, good deal of time in your book discussing developments in the railways, in the railway unions. And you describe how the Arab workers in the main, not ex entirely, but in the main were extremely reluctant to join the railway union because of the exclusionist policies of the Hissa group to which the railway union was affiliated. And um, within that union and within the industry, there was one force which you mentioned that uh, that advocated that the union leave the history group. That was the communists. But the thing that uh, that was interesting to me was that although their attitudes seemed to correspond to the views of the majority of Arab railway workers, they did get some support, but they did not become a mass force within uh, amongst the Arab railway workers. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? And if so, how do you explain that? Well, again, com a complicated story. Um, and as you mentioned, there were, um, you know, debates ab among the Arab workers, um, in the railroad workers in particular, which is one of the single largest concentration of wage workers, the people who maintain the railroads, who repaired the locomotives and the other railway equipment. Um, there were big workshops in Haifa and elsewhere where, where large numbers of workers came together, Arabs and Jews. So, of course, they had common interests, right? If they were going to get higher wages, if they were going to resist the massive inflation at the Second World War, bring uh, very uh, unsafe and difficult working conditions, they had to cooperate. They, people understood this. But, of course, for most of the Arab workers, the, the so-called international union that the that the Jewish workers belonged to was affiliated with, with the Histadrut, which was the Arab workers understood correctly was an arm of the Zionist movement. And of course, they were not happy about this. They said, well, of course, we'll cooperate. We can have a common union, but it can't be affiliated with the Histadrut. Um, the communists who really come into their own in the 1940s, um, you know, support this. Um, and, and, and the communists, to be fair, had, had inroads become a major player in on the labor scene in the 1940s uh organized in many places um you know are are uh, in in their press you know dealing with workers issues um 
and and again have have complicated interrelations with with Jewish labor leaders and Jewish workers. Um, and there are some Jewish members of the communist movement. You know, at, at various points, there were a number of different communist factions at different points. Um, you know, why why any particular group uh, gains support in one particular workplace? You know, has to do with lots of local conditions and circumstances. Um, you know, the the war brought massive economic development to Palestine. Palestine becomes a major base for British and Allied just, forces. Me, I was referring to the 1920s and early 30s. Ah, okay. Well, the communists are very weak in that period, right? There is a small, almost entirely Jewish communist party that eventually emerges in, the, in by the mid-1920s. Uh, Moscow, the common turn, the Communist International pushes it to Arabize to become a predominantly Arab party because Palestine's a predominantly Arab country. Um, it, it has a low level of activity. It's subject to a lot of repression, right? The British in Palestine is elsewhere in the empire, spends a lot of effort trying to uh, find communists, arrest them, deport them, suppress communism. So they're, they're not a big player in, in, in that period. And then you have the revolt of 1936-39, which drives a very deep wedge between Arabs and Jews and between Arab and Jewish communists such that the, the new communist movement that emerges during the Second World War, uh, we're talking about a largely Arab movement. Um, there is a Palestinian, you know, Jewish communist formation, um, but the, the, the impetus, the momentum is with Arab communists who are building a new kind of labor movement among, among workers. And, um, and it's only after 1948 that there's again, a unified now Israeli communist party which includes both Arabs and Jews, uh, which goes on to be a very significant force in the small remnant of Palestinians who were left within the borders of the state of Israel after the 1948 war. It emerges as the main defender of the rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel and, and remains a force in the, in the Palestinian uh, Israeli community to this day, although it gets, and, and formally is an Arab Jewish party, although it doesn't get all that many Jewish votes. But didn't the communists in 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 the nineteen forty eight war didn't the communists support uh, Israeli independence and I would imagine that would have had really undercut their support among Arab or Palestinians. Absolutely. So the international communist movement in the Soviet Union, right, the Communist International, until it was dissolved in nineteen forty three. Uh, always opposed Zionism. It said Zionism is, you know, a form of bourgeois nationalism, and it's uh, it's an instrument of British imperialism, right? It's being imposed on Palestine by by force. Um, so ideologically, the the communists always rejected Zionism, um, and this was the policy of the Soviet Union in the deliberations at the United Nations and elsewhere. Uh, in 1947, when Britain turned over the Palestine issue to the new United Nations and said, you know, we're, we're, we want to be out of here, you deal with this, right? Facing a, a growing Zionist insurgency in Palestine, it, it was clear that the, the future of this country was, was at stake uh, in, imminently. Um, and then in 1947, the Soviet Union reversed itself and said, basically, you know, we would like a... Uh, a united Palestine in which Arabs and Jews coexist and, and share power. But if that can't happen, second best option is, is partition. And the communists uh, recognize the existence in Palestine of a new Jewish national community. They never accepted the Zionist claim that all Jews everywhere are a nation, but they said there's emerged under the auspices of British imperialism, uh, a distinct Hebrew-speaking Jewish national community in Palestine whose rights have to be recognized alongside those of the Arabs of Palestine. Uh, and, and the Soviet Union endorsed partition. And beyond that, it was to a large extent weapons from the Soviet bloc, which enabled Zionist forces and then the, the new army of the state of Israel to win its wars in 1947-48 and, and again conquer three quarters of what had been Palestine and diplomatic support from the Soviet Union as well for Moscow's own own reasons. They wanted to get the British out of the Middle East. They wanted to inflict a blow on on British client states in the region, and and they knew that there was um, 
you know, a strong Zionist left in Palestine and in, in Israel, which was um, broadly sympathetic to the Soviet Union. So they had hoped that would perhaps turn into something. So you're quite right. Um, and from there on, um, you know, the Soviet Union, however difficult and, and frayed and hostile its relations with, with Israel became, because it came to see Israel as 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 an ally of the United States and of the Western countries, um, it always insisted that Israel as a state, right, had a right to exist. And into the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets, even as they supported the, the Palestine Liberation Organization, always argued that, you know, that, that the, the rights and of, of Jews in Palestine as a distinct national community had to be recognized and that Israel was a legitimate state, which is not something the Palestinians were interested in hearing, particularly until they too accepted partition. Um, but that was the, the, the communist stance from 1947 onward. You know, one view is that Stalin simply saw Israeli independence as a means of undercutting uh, the power of British imperialism. Yep. And he's just completely willing to sacrifice the interests of the Arab workers or the Arab masses mm -hmm. towards that goal. Yeah, that's not unreasonable. He, he Stalin had his own calculations and again, basically did a 180 degree turn in policy to embrace partition, which which the communist movement, the Soviet Union had always rejected. Um, you know, the the statements of Gromyko, who was then representing the Soviet Union at the United Nations, you know, also said, well, the Jews, of course, suffered terribly during the Second World War. Millions of them were murdered by the Nazis. So in some sense, you know, having a Jewish state in Palestine is is a recompense for this, right? So he they they, they adopted that that perspective. But yes, um, you know, Stalin had his motives, and and getting uh, the British out of the Middle East or defeating the British, who were operating through their client state in what was then called Transjordan, today Jordan, the commander of whose army was a British officer at the time and in many ways was a, a very significant fighting force, which is why Jordan ended up in control of a piece of Palestine, which then came to be called the West Bank in 1948. Um, so yeah, there were Soviet motives there. And as, as you noted earlier, right, this cost the communists a lot, because of course the overwhelming sentiment in among the Arabs of Palestine, but across the region was that partition was uh, was an abomination, was unacceptable because it, it denied the right of the, Arabs of Palestine to self-determination in their own homeland and divided, gave half their homeland to somebody else whose, whose arrival and presence they had vehemently resisted. Um, and the communists suffered a lot for having endorsed uh, partition. They fell in line like, like good communists in those days with, with the, the line from Moscow. But they suffered a lot and were accused for decades afterwards of, of having facilitated or gone along with or justified what happened in Palestine in 1948. You know, before passing on, I, I can't help but comment, you know, that it's kind of ironic what you, uh, you know, you quote Gromyko as having said, when the Soviet state itself in a in one period conducted its own anti-Semitic policies. But our time is kind of limited uh, from what I, from what you said, and I'd like to just before we finish, pass on to um, the final question: Is why is this uh, history relevant today, and what is the role of the Palestinian working class and the working class of the Arab region as a whole today, given the enormous crisis and the disaster that we are seeing? in Israel, Palestine, and in Gaza? Sure. Well, I mean, the, to talk about the region as a whole is maybe beyond the scope of, of what we can hope to do. <laughs> um, in, in most of the Arab countries, uh, the working class is, is deeply suppressed, um, and, and the authoritarian states do their best to control the working class and, and have adopted models of development, which mean exploitation and oppression. And, and do not allow any form of independent organizing or, or, or uh, class, class struggle. Um, in Palestine itself, again, it's a complicated situation, right? 
There was a time after Israel conquered the remainder of Palestine, uh, the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinian workers from Gaza and from the West Bank went to work as cheap labor in Israel, in construction and factories and all sorts of things. Uh, that came to an end with the first intifada that in, in the late 1980s, and Israel then began importing, like many countries, migrant labor from elsewhere. People may have noticed that some of the some of the people uh, abducted uh, after the October during the October seventh attack and and taken back to Gaza were Thai workers, workers from Thailand, of whom there are a great many working in Israeli agriculture um, as as exploited, uh, underpaid labor. And um, there are very few. Uh, there are still some, but much many fewer Palestinian workers. Uh, going to work in the in the much you know larger, richer Israeli economy as as exploited labor, and at the same time, Israel has systematically since 1967 strangled the economies of the West Bank and Gaza and made them subordinate to its own economy. Um, the people have called this de-development, um, such that it's been there is an Arab working class, there are trade unions, but they are weak and in you know in a very difficult position in, in the West Bank and in Gaza and unable to, to be very active on behalf of, of, of the working classes in those place. Um, and you know the Palestinians living in Israel who are now number a million and a half who are citizens of Israel uh, are members of the Histadrut. They, you know, the, if, if you go to an Israeli hospital, the pharmacists and a lot of the doctors and nurses are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Right, they're very much part of the Israeli economy, but largely in separate sectors or in lower wage sectors or in particular areas that Israeli Jews no longer are are predominant in. So, like um, all Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian working class across Palestine in its various segments are deeply fragmented, uh, deeply, um, ex you know, often exploited, um, and and find it very difficult to. To, to engage in even basic trade union activity, much less, much less a broader a broader defense of their class interests. And Gaza, of course, uh, I don't know what what candor needs to be said at this point. The horrors unfolding there uh, in the aftermath of October seventh are, I think, evident to everybody. Uh, these are poor people. These are people who are the descendants of refugees, overwhelmingly from 1948. They're the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren of people who were dispossessed in 1948 and confined to this small piece of Palestine under extremely difficult conditions and are now being seeing their, their world destroyed around them. Okay. Well, on that note, there's a, probably two or three more days of issues to be discussed but sure. i'd like to thank you very much for your time thank you and uh, to be continued thank you very much be well okay